All right, we're live. How are you doing, Glenn? I am great. How are you doing? Cool. Yeah. It's good to good to be talking to you again. <laughs> good to see you. Yeah. Um, and we saw each other in Pennsylvania. I think it was the last time we saw. Yes. Uh, yeah. Back at the uh, oh gosh, Square Halo conference. Yeah. Which was a great time. That was a good. That was good. Yeah, I still kind of have fond memories of like that 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 weather for some reason. I think of like I don't know, just maybe the changing of the seasons. So. Yeah. Um, but your Kickstarter is um, coming to a close. Like you only have seven days or uh, six days. Yeah, pretty much a week from today. Next Thursday, November tenth, is when uh, when we hit the finish line. Yeah. Um, so uh, so fans of my channel are, are just followers. Um, I'm usually reviewing comics and talking about my own stuff, but um, today, uh, well, I do. Th I'm interested in writing in general about stories, and so um, this is different. Um, Glenn McCarty is a uh, an author of prose um, prose fiction, and this is his middle grade um, book called "The Misadventured Summer of Tumbleweed Thompson." And um, the first book is I've just started reading it today. And um, I really, I really enjoy it. I was struck by how much I, I actually enjoyed it. Um, it and uh, I have sort of started uh, reading more middle grade fiction, and I don't always, I don't always enjoy it. I must say. And so to uh, read, you know, start crack, crack it open and read it today, um, I really, I really enjoyed it. But his second, uh, his second book in the series is on Kickstarter right now. And um, Glenn, do you want to tell us about it? Yeah, for sure. So um, it's a frontier adventure for, for uh, young people and any people who enjoy, you know, adventure and, and humor and all that good stuff. Um, it takes place in the late 1800s in Colorado um, in a town called Rattlesnake Junction. Um, and in the first book, it's uh, it's two buddies, as you saw on the cover there. Um, the narrator is, is kind of the, the town kid, and then he uh, he kind of bumps into this kid who's brand new to town who has a lot of stories about all the places he's been and the things that he's done that are kind of like half true. Um, and so they, they develop a friendship and then they have a little bit of a rivalry. But as the book goes on, they uh, they run afoul of some outlaws and, and uh, feel like they're supremely qualified at the age of 12 to try to like take all that on by themselves. Um, and uh, And so that book came to a close with well, I don't know. You just started reading it. I don't. I don't feel like yeah. I want to. I don't feel like I want to say anything. Um, but <laughs> if you, if you need to say something to to get us to the to the next book. Don't don't worry. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so they um, the second book is definitely less about the adventures. Um, someone that reviewed the first book said it was sort of backyard kind of boy sized adventures, um, and I thought it would be a very interesting development if we took those two boys who are now going to be 13 in the second book and got them out of their hometown and just into all of the wildness of Colorado and New Mexico and, um, and the, the beautiful vistas and just the landscapes. And, and there seemed to be some really cool thematic stuff about, um, you know, ambition and like, what, what do you, you know, what do you want with your life? Um, and so one of the, one of the sort of subplots of the first book is that, um, the main character, Eugene, is very influenced by his reading of these uh, kind of dime novels starring this guy named Dead Eye Dan Crowley, um, who's like the classic U.S. Marshal. He's kind of like MacGyver meets the Mandalorian kind of thing. He just, there's nothing he can't do, but he uses his wits to get out of all these jams. But um, anyway, so um, in the second book, uh, Eugene and Tumbleweed uh, meet the author of the, the Dead Eye Dan books, and instantly that's like Eugene's number one hero. Obviously, other than Dead Eye Dan, who's not real, if he can meet the author, the guy who you know all these books came from. And so, once he meets his hero, he kind of sees, oh my gosh, maybe I could, maybe I could have some adventures like like this guy. And so, um, the the second book was just a hoot to write because there's so many so many cool things that can happen out there on the trail. It's sort of a treasure hunt kind of book. Um, I had a lot of fun making up this whole mythology of this buried treasure in the American West. Um, sort of like some of the things that existed in, in legends, but, um, but hopefully, you know, feeling, feeling familiar, but, and there's a lot of that with this, this series in general, it's just sort of feeling familiar and reminiscent of, of those kinds of stories. But, um, but yet, but get new, you know, um, as well. So, 
Yeah. Um, I think it's, I, I'm, I love it. I, as you said, we're in the middle of crowdfunding it and I, I really hope that it, it has the chance to get out there and stand alongside the first one. Cause, um, it might not be the last one in this series either. So, yeah, yeah I love how you filled out like, well, just w- world creation. I mean, you're not necessarily whole cloth because it's set in Colorado and it is the West, <clears> but it definitely, um, it definitely feels developed in a holistic way where you've got internal stories inside the stories and yeah. you have, well, the, the, uh, title character, uh, is not actually the, the viewpoint character. And, um, I thought that was a special, like just a great way to provide distance and depth to the whole, um, narrative, um, because the, uh, the narrative voice is a different is the other boy, uh, not Tom Boy Thompson. And so I feel like you've done really remarkably well at providing, um, like, you know, the enjoyability of a world, um, instead of, uh, I guess more simplistic. Um, but. Yeah, I, I love that. I think I've always been drawn to, um, and not just books, but just fictional worlds that, that are, that are revisited, you know, um, even going back to something as simple as like the town of Mayberry and Andy Griffith, which was, you know, um, and again, even that was sort of like a, like a simplified kind of romanticized version of, of Andy Griffith's home, uh, Andy Griffith's hometown, you know, it didn't really exist like that. Um, but you know, the more time you spend there, you kind of see, oh, there's that, there's that one guy we met for that like brief moment in that one episode, but now we're going to find out a little bit more about him and it's all connected. And it just, I don't know. It always has felt very, um, very authentic. And, um, and yeah, I mean, rattlesnake junction, the wild West. I mean, there's a reason why it was called the wild West. I mean, you know, there was some crazy, you know, like very illegal stuff going on all the time. And obviously that doesn't really fit very naturally in a book for young readers. Um, but it felt, I don't know. It just felt like, because a lot of the old, the old West has come to us in sort of legends and, you know, and, and there are so many disputed facts that it just seems like there's a lot of room for just, like you said, like not really whole cloth, but there's a lot of room for just, you know, kind of putting your own, own spin on things, I think. And so there's pieces of a lot of different kind of mythologies and stories within this that are, you know, there's a little bit of Tom Sawyer for sure, because I feel like you can't write, a boy adventure book set in that time period without it feeling like it. Cause Mark Twain just, you know, did such a, it's like an archetype. Um, so many of the different things. And I mean, I'm aware, like there's a section in this book where they're sneaking around caves and I'm like, yeah, okay. I mean, I, I know, yeah. <laughs> I know sneaking around caves is a very Tom Sawyer Huck Finn thing to do, but you know, yeah. but like, okay, fine. Like yeah. that's okay. Like it, it suits our purposes. And honestly, it's like when you have any kind of like, backdrop or sandbox or anything you're like okay this is the setting that exists now now what do i get to do with it you know and i think um in this case it it becomes a much more uh comic uh kind of ridiculous scenario than it is this like edge of your seat kind of tense moment like it might be in another story and that yeah that's fun too is taking familiar things um but presenting them in a way that feels a little bit more unexpected i guess you know yeah it seemed like a tightrope that like i if i were walking i would have fallen off a lot of times like uh, and maybe you did in certain drafts and had to pull it back but it was like i didn't know i didn't know how you were going to solve certain problems um that looked like they could be uh like really dangerous um and uh you did but you didn't make it like goofy um, in the certain, you know, in the, so far as I've read it, nothing felt goofy. Um, and, uh, and I just thought that was remarkable that to have that, to have that, you know, just threading that needle of, um, adventure illegality. Yes. (laughs) Illegality. uh, (laughs) And not, you know, not making it horrific i mean you know yeah um... yeah i mean i think the emotional truth of like okay the viewpoint character like you said is this 12 year old kid and like okay that that really helps to sort a lot of things because there's there's certain things 
you know, like I even remember like the sort of idea of like shooting at kids, like, okay, we've got these outlaws. I'm not going to say too much about them, but they're, they're outlaws. They're bad guys. They're, they're grown men, you know, and yet they find themselves up against these two 12 year old kids. I mean, the horrific thing to do would be like the most outlaw kind of response. But I mean, you know, I don't know if that's, yeah. that's probably not going to happen. So, but also just um, thinking about everything as it goes through like a, like a, the mind of like a, like a 12 year old or a 13 year old, you know, like how are, how are they responding to things? How are they seeing things? Um, you know, like there's a scene, I'm not sure how far you've gotten, but pretty early on, Tumbleweed kind of talks Eugene into this midnight escapade where they're going to, he's gotten like a word he heard from a friend of a friend that, that there are these smugglers that come through on this river with these flat bottom boats and they're perfect for just, you know, smuggling goods. And I heard there was going to be some gunpowder and we can sneak onto their boat and we can steal some and we can get out of there. And of course they get caught. And, you know, yeah, there is a very tense moment where it's like, holy cow, you know, but because it's told through the mind of, um, or through the, through the viewpoint and through the mind of, of Eugene, the main character, um, you know, there, there's several moments in that scene where he's just like, this is terrifying. Holy cow, did I Dan? This is so awesome. And I yeah. feel like yeah. there's an element of that. Like, yeah. I don't know. I mean, yeah. sort of like living in two realities at once that I feel like is very, like I have a, I have Boy-ish, a 12 year old yeah. son right now. And like, yeah. that's very much like, Yes. You're aware that you're living in this world and there's real stakes and there's like guns and bullets, but you're also aware that like in your mind, you're replaying that like really memorable scene from the dead eye Dan book that you just read where he like did some crazy feat and you're like, Oh my gosh, I'm living in a dead eye Dan book. <laughs> and I think that was, that was really helpful to kind of keep filtering everything through, you know, what's the, like, what's the genre. It's not just a sort of generic western it's i mean it's first and foremost uh you know like a middle grade a book for for young people and and it's kind of also a coming of age story i think going back to that viewpoint question you're talking about with eugene being the, the narrator um it felt like in terms of a character who would be more inclined to have an arc um it seemed like eugene it was kind of his story um and even even to the point where he kind of has a frame a little bit of a frame, kind of an undefined frame around it where he's telling it with some kind of distance. We don't know how long it's been since all this stuff happened, but that just seemed like part of it too, is that he's the, you know, he's the one who's, who's sort of going through that coming of age where he's not the same kid that he was at the beginning of the book that he is at the end. Um, plus he's kind of the straight man. If they're sort of a comedy duo, I mean, he and Tumbley are really a comedy duo, but they have that element of the straight man and the, and the crazy one. Yeah. Um, it just, it seemed like it made more sense to have, yeah. to have the straight man be the narrator, you know, and then allow, yeah. allow him to try to, I mean, I'm always drawn to someone like Kermit the frog, who's like the, the still center of this Muppet insanity that's going on around him. And he's trying to hold it all together. Yeah. And I feel like there are moments in this book where Eugene is just like, what is actually going on right now? Okay. I've got to like keep my head and like, you know, crazy stuff is happening. And that just adds to the, yeah. I don't know. I feel like there's a, there's an opportunity for humor there as mm-hmm. well. You know? Yeah. I think it's really smart for the audience as well, because typically, <clears throat> uh, you know, I don't know if I'm spoiling anyone's like thought of what, what readers at that age are, but typically readers at that age are not, um, especially if they're boys, they're not like sport, typically sporty. I mean, they, they should, yeah, I think people would love to be all well-rounded, but I remember like I fit, I fit that description of that person who is into books and uh, movies. And so there's less, adventure outside of my body you know and a lot of adventure Mm -hmm. in my head and um you know i just feel like that is the demographic that would be reading these books and um and so to have a character uh to take you know a character inside the books that responds to that kind of reality outside in the yeah uh, um reader is i think it's it it seems it kind of seems to follow suit with like um like the Hobbit and like Tolkien, well, you know, Tolkien did actually have a kind of adventurous early, you know, war life. Mm-hmm. Right. But, um, but after that, I mean, when he was writing, I think he, he had lived, lived a pretty, um, 
you know, domestic life. And right. um, I feel like the Hobbit is very much that character to take all the bookish people into this, this fantasy world. And Yeah, exactly. And there's that reluctance and that, like that, those two parts of you, right. The Tukish part and the, the Baggins part that are sort of like, that's like such a quintessential like dilemma, right? Like, yeah. and, uh, and it was hard at the beginning, you know, like you, you kind of have to, I mean, Eugene is, is, uh, you know, he, he like he's the, the two parts of him, right? Like he's reluctant, but then at the same time, and I'm, I, I'm embarrassed that I'm forgetting exactly what the line is, but he has this line where he like, doesn't, he doesn't throw something out or he doesn't tell somebody something because he's sort of still holding out hope that like, Tumbleweed will come back into his life and they'll be able to have some of these adventures. But it's, you know, it's still that, like that reluctance, you know? And I think, um, but then like with, like with the reader, like you said, like the reader's like, Oh, come on. No, no, you're going to, you're going to go do some things, right? Like let's, you know, you're, you're hoping that that adventure, uh, yeah. gets to happen, you know? So, um, so how did like, uh, how did your, you know, uh, I'm going to call it love of the old West or, um, you know, I, I only know you as a, you know, living in upstate New York or, or New York um, right. state. And uh, how did, how did this interest come and how did you get to sort of figure out that kind of language? Um, and, you know, a lot of details of the, I feel like the type of economy, a little bit of a, not necessarily economy, but like there were details in it that um, I was interested in as someone that like, I don't know, it just, it, the world did feel detailed enough for me to feel like I was, I was in the old West. Um, so how did that, how did you? Yeah. <laughs> um, I have not been, I, I would say definitely I have not been like an, an old West nut. Um, in, in fact, I was just not too long ago, I was on a, a podcast and they thought it would be funny to ask me a bunch of like old West oh. trivia, outlaw trivia. And I kind of bombed at it because like, I mean, you know, since I've started the last six or seven years writing various books that are set in this world, I've read some things, some biographies and stories about, you know, Tombstone and things like that. But um, I've not always been a nut specifically for the Old West, but I think there's definitely a, a mystery, an openness to, you know, just kind of like big sweeping things. Um, and then you kind of layer that with, uh, at least in the first tumbleweed book, kind of like the small town kind of vibe that, um, that I really liked. And then you talked about writing for the old West. I, I feel like what is so fun about it from like a language standpoint is that other than like anachronisms, like phrases that didn't exist yet. Um, like I wanted to have tumbleweed say Shazam in the, in the first book, second book, I can't remember. And I, you know, I soon remembered, oh yeah, Shazam didn't really come around until the 20th century. Yeah. So that can't happen. <laughs> but like within reason, like it all seems so again, like sort of legendary that like you can even just sort of invent a, a vocabulary and a lexicon that sort of feels antiquated. Yeah. Uh, but, but I mean, it's, who knows? It was probably not nearly as, as authentic and even like names. Like I think there's so much fun you can have with names yeah. because if it's a weird first name, like, Oh yeah, sure. That feels sort of old timey. Like yeah. there's a character named Rubicon in this book and like yeah. Rubicon. I mean, I doubt that was a name that anybody had in the old West, but I just thought it was, I thought it was fun. Absalom biblical names. You yeah. can really have some fun with all these, yeah. You know, without like Methuselah or like the really biblical names, yeah. you can certainly get get going with a lot of that stuff and just goofy expressions. And even like the middle grade reader, I mean, I'm, I'm definitely feel like I'm pushing the vocabulary kind of a lot. Um, there are definitely and I've never been been worried too much about, you know, challenging a little bit. You know, if you provide enough context with what's going on. Yeah throwing in some vocabulary that probably is not a word that they've encountered before. Um, but you know, but it feels right for that particular, um, time period, I guess, even if it's not something that was used, uh, it just feels kind of weird enough, you know, like arc I love like archaic words, archaic phrases, um, like bizarre cliches. Um, in fact, I had a friend, oh, I'm not going to remember what it was now. Shoot. 
Putin. She used a, she used a weird expression that her like grandma had used just like last summer we were on vacation or we were hanging out with them or something. Yeah. And I was like, Oh my gosh. And that totally made it, made its way into the second tumbleweed manuscript because I was like, it's just fun. And yeah. nobody says that anymore. Yeah. Um, Oh, I, it was, uh, I was, uh, I don't give a flying fig about that. And I was just like, I, I mean, I feel like at some point in my yeah. long past, I heard some old person say that, but I was just like, Oh, that's great. You know, it just fits in this world, you know, cause it's kind of, I don't know. And the, and these are, are, there's a humorous element too. So I feel like you can, yeah, that's the, that's the pleasure I think of mm-hmm. these kinds of stories, whether they're, you know, maybe it's not specifically the old West, but, you know, you're kind of just, I don't know. People are saying weird things. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah, it, yeah. I mean, uh, my first book, Joe death and the graven image is it, it is set in the wet at uh, the West. I mean, it, it's sort of the, the general makeup of the territory or terrain, but um, I really have no necessarily intention to draw a map of the continent or, um, right. Uh, yeah, it, it just to me it seemed like a big canvas that is a part of our roots too, um, and so there's a, some some type of affinity with our heritage. Like every, mm-hmm. you know, everyone in America, you know, uh, unless you're you know, recently have come over, you have that heritage as part of your you know the, of the past, and um, and it, obviously it is an entertainment genre. But I do feel like genres can get pretty stale when they're when they're just just like a redo of a redo of a redo in a genre, and all the tropes like just stack up and stuff like um, you know like naming uh, a character Rubicon. It's like that that word existed before col- you know colonization and people moving out west. Right. Um, right. In in Roman, you know, there's a, a mm-hmm. river, right? Yeah, in the in the ancient Europe, or Europe, <laughs> and uh, I I love thinking about that as a broader term, as a just broadening my imagination of what was in the past. You know, like King Arthur legends were they on? You know, were they on? Mm, yeah. Um, you know, uh, um, covered wagon trains out. You know, like there were there were so many so much of the past that. It existed before um, all of these types of things that we just kind of associate with this, like uh, as it, we just sort of draw around a circle in our imagination of like what the old West was. And right. I love it when things permeate, I think things permeate and are brought through um, into, into that world. Like, like let's say a suit of armor, you know, like uh, mm. being taken out there for uh, who knows, you know, for, um, just like a casino or, you know, but some, some heritage of, of a night in Europe or, um, like there are so, there are so many past things that could permeate that, like what I feel like is a tight entertainment genre. And, um, I'm interested really in like, in that kind of space of, um, of creating as well. Um, and I think that's fun that you're doing that with language and it, it's yeah, like, and I, th- I like yeah. that you're saying, like, I think, like, not not being afraid to push back on what is, like, the the sacred cows of the Old West. Like, the, you know, like, we can't, we can't allow anything else. Because it really, I mean, even, like, somebody like Mark Twain, who's considered to be, like, as authentic a writer about this time period. Like, I mean, he's he's looking back on his boyhood from about, like, I think 30 or 40 years and... And he's not, I mean, come on, he's Mark Twain. He's not telling the truth. I mean, like, so to think that he's somehow got like an authentic claim on, on what exactly, like he's even morphing and twisting. And so, I mean, I feel like, and like you said, it does sort of freshen it up a little bit. I'm, I've just really enjoyed the heck out of the Mandalorian because of that sort of like that genre fusing and, you know, like, like you said, kind of like being, being acknowledging there are some roots in the Westerns of, and the, you know, but like, but yet not being afraid to just add elements that are so clearly new to that. You know, I, I like that a lot, you know? Yeah. 
I think there, I think with a lot of writers, especially younger or beginning writers, or um, you know, obviously the people that haven't kind of won their spurs yet, there's there does seem to be this like um, challenge of getting stuff right, and it's like, oh my goodness, you know, I'm not expert in this, I'm not an expert in that, I'm not an expert in that, you know, there's so many things that we're not expert in, um, but we still have a desire to, to just essentially tell a tall tale that has a a moral or some just, there's some theme there's some we have some quality that we want to express and um we just happen to not be an expert in in all yeah. these things that that i do feel like people come at authors a lot for you know you're not an expert in this you know this is and i don't exactly know why they want more realism uh or right. more facts because like you you that's really the not what we're trying to provide. We're trying to provide, you know, a, 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 an experience to escape into and learn some kind of truth uh, from. Yeah, it. and it's by its nature, it's kind of a lie, right? I mean, it's fiction. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, right. It's like all you really want is that internal consistency. I think. I mean. Uh, yeah. C- certainly. Yeah. I mean, I guess maybe, like you said, someone might come at these books and say, "Are these really historical fiction?" I mean. I don't know. I feel like sometimes historical fiction with middle grade is kind of like the kiss of death because <laughs> yeah. like it's got the word history in it and yeah. no kid wants to read about that. Yeah. But I feel like, you know, the, I certainly believe that the more granular with your details that you can be, um, the more connection that the reader can have with, with, with your story and not just from a picture standpoint, but like, it kind of helps pull them back into their own world, you know, like, okay, those are the things that Eugene is thinking about, or he's sitting on the Creek and I'm trying to get all the details right of the fishing pole and this and that. But I, you know, I know what happens is then you're thinking back about your own frame of reference and your own details. It's like, I think I heard somebody say like the more fully you are into that world, the more fully you're like able to kind of see and understand and appreciate your own world. Um, and that just is a matter of just get internal consistency. Like do all the rules match up and does the world have that, you know, that kind of thing. But yeah, yeah, I mean, nothing, I don't, yeah, nothing about the first book kicked me out and to thinking that's unrealistic or like unrealistic in the, in the setting, like you're saying, uh, internal consistency um and yeah i, th- I think that is such an interesting point where you're you're just you you're providing because uh, that that is kind of, that is sort of realism which is realism or our worlds do have a unbreakable consistency of gravity or um consequences you know if you're mean to someone yeah you know you don't expect a good response um if you're mean to someone you know um like all these type of gravity type of things that that cause us to to think in realistic ways um or uh affect and and cause and um inside a story that is that is i feel like what always kicks me out is like thinking like this doesn't seem to line up with what you've said before um yeah and yeah yeah um uh so i do have um a few questions sure. um and uh or, you know, continuation questions but um yeah how when you do when you do start writing or like um how conscious are you of other stories uh when you when you're thinking about writing or trying to find a story or trying to yeah how are you when you are writing, are you searching, are you pulling off, you know, other books that you, um, are, are just a fan of to, to kind of help you? I think, yeah. I mean, I think that I would think yes. And I, I don't, I don't want that to seem like derivative, but I think we we're talking about genre earlier. And I think having a good, like a really good sense of what genre you're operating in can, <clears throat> I don't know. I think, you know, when you get to be my age and you've grown up with reading and absorbing movies and TV shows and, and comics and all these things, like it, I'm really grateful that a lot of these things are kind of like just hardwired in, you know, like understanding 
if if two people are you know are like racing down a street you know like just kind of understanding so many different possibilities for how that could go and like you know being aware of all the influences that are kind of like coming into play within that genre you know um and i i mean i don't i think sometimes i will do sort of homage to certain things but i think uh, more often than not, it's more of a like a fusing of of various influences or even various genres, kind of mashing them up a little bit. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, there's a there's a big section in the middle of this book where where Eugene and Tumble we get into this ridiculous sort of mistaken identity kind of twist thing. It's just so ridiculous and, and I think really pretty funny by the end of it. Um, but that like that's operating within a, a sort of tradition of that kind of thing that happens yeah. where either people get mistaken for someone else or people try to disguise themselves as someone else. And, and, you know, even with young readers, I feel like if you do it right, that sort of like situational, that irony of like them kind of knowing what the two characters don't know, which is on a basic level, this is never going to work. How do you think this is a good idea? Um, and then just playing that along and, and letting the audience kind of live with the, like the staring as, oh my gosh, are they really going to try to like, you know, disguise themselves as each other? Like, you know, I think yeah. that's always like a understanding, maybe it is tropes, you know, I think a trope is kind of like a, almost like a dirty word in the sense right. that sometimes people are like, trope is just a way of saying, oh, you don't have any new ideas, so you're just going to recycle old ones, but I think having a good understanding of so many of those tropes allows you to, to go beyond them in some way, you know, incorporate, but not just recycle, you know, yeah. upcycle like, yeah. or something. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. It's like, um, it's like a positive satire. It's like, there's like satirical, which is like, you know, snide and like, um, you know, we're going to make fun of what's come before, uh, by like, I don't know, you know, but it's, it's, by making it cynical or something. Right. Right. Um, but, but keeping it going, keeping that kind of joke going by using it again and, you know, it's, and it will always be a little different in the details. Um, I do feel like it, you know, it's a positive type of satire. Um, and, uh, and it's cool. It worked in Harry Potter. I mean, it's that, 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 uh, that kind of gag worked. There. Sure. And, uh, yeah. And, yeah. And it, it so much, so much of what works in stories comes out of who the characters are and the connection that the readers are making with those characters. I feel like so many good things, you know, if you've done the work of sort of building a character well, you don't, sometimes the audience will laugh. I find this right now we're, we're rewatching my wife and I, the, um, the big bang theory mm -hmm. from the beginning and, and the character of Sheldon, like there are so many situations where he's such a well, created character from the writing and the acting mm -hmm. that somebody will say something and you start laughing because you just know how that's mm -hmm. going to affect Sheldon yeah. before he even reacts or does anything as an actor. And I just think that's such a great, that's such a great thing. So, I mean, like when you're, you know, like when you're talking about tropes, like these characters in this situation have been created hopefully as unique creations of yourself. And mm -hmm. so you know, um, even though there might be a situation that involves like disguises or trying to do mistaken identity or whatever, it's going to be flowing out of these characters who have these motivations and these insecurities and, and it, it won't, it won't be nearly as unoriginal. I think when I was younger, I was a lot more hung up on being original, Yeah, you know, whatever. I, I thought that was like the most important thing. Um, but I, I definitely think that just, you know, being authentic and, and truthful is like the most important thing. Um, yeah. That being original is just kind of overrated, you know? Yeah. Cause I don't even know what it means, honestly. Yeah. I, I think it is like handcuffs on every new, every new artist or writer, um, you know, that we're either placing on ourselves or the creative culture is kind of, is sort of trying to elevate themselves or uh, denigrate you or like yeah. a lot of, mind games um happening there and a lot of it is it's just ourselves with these expectations because we ne don't necessarily know how tolkien wrote the lord of the rings or uh you know mark twain worked or 
there's like there's like a, a majesty in the sort of distance um but then when we get to read these kind of authors lives we realize oh yeah they're they were borrowing all you know all the time um and sure. just you know they you know we we copy and we keep um yeah it's like you can't you can't help but make something your own if you are the creator of it i think is the um unless yeah. you're just straight uh um copying everything but um yeah uh the video is gonna uh, end in a minute um okay. and so i better just like cut off here and then uh if you want to talk a little bit more yeah um, we can talk a little more sure i got a couple minutes so. okay sounds good all right you send me another link then yep i'll, I'll end it now and okay. i'll send you you know, you know all right yeah thanks Liz. sounds good uh it was great to talk about uh just authorial vo voice i feel like we talk mostly about um yeah. do you have uh do you have any bit of well first of all you you this isn't your full-time gig you are a high school teacher um yeah right right yeah. middle school english yeah middle school okay yeah. seventh and eighth graders yeah um how can you tell us how you how you got to this point as as a author who has now written uh four or five books uh, three books, yeah. Okay, three books. Oh, well, I guess four if you would count. Hopefully, the forthcoming sequel, yes. Okay, yeah. How did you carve out time? And you know, you're a father and also a teacher, and I'm sure very busy other things. Too. Yeah. Um, I think the biggest secret that I've found is take it when you can get it. I think, um, and consistency. Probably those would be the two things. Um, the times that I've been the most successful, I think definitely when I was first starting out, I thought I got to have long blocks of time. I got to be able to have a long amount of time at a single stretch to be able to accomplish anything. And then I was sort of fortunately, um, like, uh, relieved of that responsibility. I heard, a um, an author, um, talk i don't even know how long ago and she said that at the time she was teaching middle school and she was i think her kids were in school and she talked about how she would go to her son's like volleyball practice and she'd sit up in the top row of the bleachers and just like headphones and she'd take 20 minutes and she'd write four paragraphs or something and so she was just like you know um obviously that has some challenges you know but i think for me, the big takeaway was, you know, quit being so whiny. Like you, you don't, you're not going to have an hour and a half or two hours, right? Like don't, hmm. don't wait for that. Um, take it when you can get it. Yeah. But I do think, um, like creative, like consistency or creative ritual, um, is really important. So, I mean, whether it's like having, you know, certain nights of the week, um, or, you know, certain that are pretty much kind of the same location. Yeah. Um, I think there's something to do with like muscle memory and stuff like that. Hmm. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, it's, it is definitely a challenge to sort of jump back in, I think with fiction, you know, um, to get back into the world, it's kind of like, you know, like <laughs> you have to sort of almost get like sucked through a portal in your mind and that's hard. Um, yeah. and I think I have found that having, I used to be more of a, like a pantser, you know, like kind of just not planned out as hardcore as much. Yeah. But I think knowing that now, um, with the exception of the summer, which is a little bit lighter from a schedule standpoint as a teacher, still just having more of a like turn by turn directions almost, mm. you know, without kind of killing the spontaneity of it yeah. um, has meant that, you know, I can almost like consult, you know, okay, it's been a couple days. I got to try. I, I left. I always think it's funny to like think about like your main character just kind of like frozen and hanging out. Yeah. Like I'm in the middle of writing like another, I, I had a dead idea in the novel, a standalone come out last October and I'm in the middle of writing another one. And, um, you know, I always thought it was funny. Like when a couple days would go by in between scenes and like, I left him like hanging from a fire escape or something. Yeah. And I just kind of picture him in my mind. I don't know why it's just hilarious to think about him just like hanging there. Like, you know, like someone going to come, like tell me what to do next. And like, I'm just leaving him there. So I think being able to like have an idea of, okay, so as soon as that happens, then I know where he's going next mm -hmm. means that I don't have to like work as hard to get back into it. Um, yeah. because like you said, with, with lots of obligations, I think, um, yeah, you know, it's just not going to be possible, but yeah. I do think the consistency, the creative habit, like, um, there's that, that really great book. I think it's called the creative habit. Mm -hmm. Um, where she talks about, 
you know, just having certain things that kind of like activate, okay, now it's time to do this. And I mean, she links it to other professions, you know, like batters who have like the elaborate pre, mm. you know, like they do their batting gloves or yeah. Rafael Nadal does things with his water bottles in the tennis court. Like, I feel like it's just a way of activating, okay, now it's time to go do the thing, yeah. you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I feel like I need to get weirder in that. <laughs> like, like <laughs> I make coffee and <laughs> like that's the only which every i feel like every uh writer and artist does um but man i tell you that like if that gets associated with it like the smell of it right yeah. i like it i light a candle i think i got that yeah, from that okay. book i read like it's some it feels really weird yeah but at the same time like yeah. there's a few little sensory things like a click you know and then like the obviously the, the candle and the light and all that stuff it's just a little you know and it just kind of yeah primes you a little bit you know yeah the material of us you know our, our like spiritual side needs the material as well and so the, yeah that interaction is really that's super interesting um but uh thank you so much for for talking and yeah uh, good to uh, talk to you yeah, it's fun god bless on the um on the kickstarter i backed it today as well and I'm excited ah, to, that's the best thank to, you yeah yeah all right um uh, that's it. <laughs> let me let me stop the video and uh, I'll talk to you a little bit more. But uh, okay, yeah. Thanks, everybody.